Thank you very much um, for, for the invitation. This is called uh, Killing the Golden Goose, and the Golden Goose here refers to scientific knowledge. Uh, Simon Kuznets said that the defining characteristic of modern economic growth is the systematic application of science to economic ends. I'm going to talk in a li little bit more precisely, but before that, just a brief remark. Uh, my interest in this was started when Alfonso Gambardella and I started working. His name is not here, but his DNA is very much here in, this, uh, in, in the material. Um, the, the, the topic is, is corporate research and what's been happening to research. We all, at least in economics, use R and D as if this was one word, but there is R and there is D. Most of what I'm going to talk about is how the R is going down relative to the D. That's, if you, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. Less R, more D. Um, we're going to start not at the beginning, but in the middle. This is the way research was organized in corporations after, after, the war, after World War II, which is you have, it's a vertically integrated company controlled system. And these three guys, were responsible for, putting, for, for pioneering this model. That's Willis Whitney at General Electric, Frank Jewett at AT&T Bell Labs, Ken Mies at Kodak. I don't have Charles Stein at DuPont. If you wanted a fourth picture to round it up, those would be the four people. These were the people that pioneered the corporate lab. Not as an end in itself, as an engine of, of corporate growth. Right? And here you see in the bottom, if, if, um, if, if you get a chance to sort of blow it up, these were the corporate research labs, ivory towers, far away from the rest of the corporation. Right? Their job was to come up with, with brilliant ideas that would fuel, if you see the, 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 the picture of the right, that would fuel economic, uh, sorry, corporate growth. Roughly speaking, starting in the middle 19, 1950s onwards in America, this was the golden period. Most of these companies, without exception, used to, do, used to have first-rate corporate research labs no longer. Uh, many of them don't exist anymore. Of course, that... This was the golden period. These are just some of the Nobel Prizes that, that corporate researchers, research employed, in corporate labs one. There are many more. These are just some of them that came out during this time. Much of what we do in economics and to considerable extent in business strategy is framed by this mental vision of how corporate innovation happens. Really bright guys, Nobel quality research happening, eventually leading to new products that will make lots of money. Here, so I said we started in the middle, because this is not how research, how innovation was organized. This picture, this, this graph is from um, uh, Ken Sokolov, the late Ken Sokolov and Naomi Lamoureux, and what it shows is in 1870s, there were lots of independent inventors who were inventing and selling their patents, assigning their patents to corporations. These are some of the great inventors from the time. But the thing that I want you to remember is, if you think about the railroads, which were the technically the most sophisticated enterprise of its kind in the 1870s, very, you know, we don't think of railroads now as technically sophisticated, but for the time, it was the most sophisticated thing. And they relied almost entirely on external inventors, till George Westinghouse who invented the air brake and refused to license it to them. That was the beginning of the end, if you like, for, for this, this market reliance. So uh, I'm just going to skip through this. By the way, there was much of what we think as new to this economy 
happened then. There was local venture capital. There were people taking stakes in, invent, in, in inventors, backing them. Um, and this system declined after 1890s, leading to the system that I started out with, this vertically integrated system. So this is the way things used to happen. And the argument is, this is where we're going to. Um, Karl Marx said that history repeats itself first as a tragedy, then as a farce. Not sure history ever quite repeats itself, but to the extent that history does, this, this system is closer to where we're headed, um, with some, some important exceptions. So I, I told you that companies are, I showed you some pictures. Um, let me show you data. Um, these are data from the, from the US. These are all US data, I apologize. Those, that's where I work, those are the data I have. Uh, these are from the National Science Foundation, and what they show is the share of basic and applied research in total business R&D has fallen, and has steadily fallen from roughly the mid-80s. It doesn't matter how you cut these data. You can look at business-performed research, you can do business-funded research. However you do it, that, this, there's a downward trend, right? So the, the pictures, the anecdotes I showed you are matched in the data. Here are new, new data that we put together, Sharon Bellinzon, Andrea Potaconi, and, and I put together, where these are confidential data by using publicly available data on, on uh, publications and matching them to the, to, matching the authors to the institution. We can see what's been happening. And again, you see the same picture. The share of companies that publish has fallen. These are all publicly traded companies. Uh, the share of companies has fallen. If you look at controlling for size, you, st you know, if you do more sophisticated regressions, you still get the same answer. Less R, more D. So far, fairly uncontroversial. Here's the part that, that starts to become more interesting, which is one reason why companies might be doing less research is because research is less useful. That's the most obvious thing to think about is, well, this has been asserted that now we don't need science. We can just use data and discover new things or it's apps or something else. Um, it's difficult to systematically measure re the use of research, but one way we can do it is we can look at patents that cite scientific publications. And if you look at that, the answer is, there is no reduction in the use of research. There's no reduction in the use of research by corporate patents. And in fact, the vintage of the research cited hasn't uh, become older. So we're citing at or at higher rates, and we're citing equally recent science. Right? So research continu science continues to be useful. Um, however, what you see is that the private value of research measured either in terms of the stock market value or in terms of the price paid in mergers and acquisitions, that has clearly changed over this period. And that's what this picture shows, is that pr while it remains useful in the technical sense, in the economic sense, it's become less valuable. That's in some sense, which is why companies are doing less of it. The question is why. Many possible um, interpretations have been, or explanations have been offered. The decline of monopoly power, or the, both the pr presence of antitrust and the absence of antitrust have been asserted as reasons for why corporate search has declined. Um, activist shareholders, hedge funds, private equity, that kind of stuff. Short-termism amongst capital markets and investors. The rise of China increasing competition, increasing globalization. Lots of different explanations have been offered. I, I'm not going to sort that one out for you today. What, what I can do is, is offer you the following thought, which is, as, John Mar as, as Marco said, um, it's a, if scientific publications are a public good, the first question we should ask is, why were for-profit companies investing in this public good to begin with. Why did it make sense for them to do that? 
One answer is because it was privately useful to the companies. Okay? And if you start from that, then one reason why internal research may be falling is because some of the reasons internal research was useful to companies are diminishing in importance. For instance, GE started its internal research because they could not get MIT to pay attention to the problems that they were interested in. And there weren't enough outside technical specialists. There weren't enough, basically the university and the startups that universities generate didn't exist. All of that has changed. And so what, you, what you're seeing now is in, an entire ecosystem where companies can get access to the knowledge that they need in a variety of ways. Um, I put two here, one is universities, and the second is these um, specialist industries um, that, are, that are responsible. The bigger point I want to make is there's more than one way to share. There's the sharing that the open innovation guys talk about, and then there is sharing through the market. Thank you.